the scripture reading this morning, Romans chapter, verses 21 to 26. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God, our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them too in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Thanks, Chris, for us. Uh, just a few minutes ago, uh, uh, Jonathan had us uh, praying Congolese style, and I noticed us uh, uh, white North Americans, we're, we're pretty timid. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, the conference asked me to uh, mentor this pastor from the Congo, him and his wife, uh, and uh, the respect that they uh, treated me with is, is very humble. And God and their passion for prayer. And so they suggested that we get together and we pray together. So one Sunday late afternoon, we met in the boardroom and we were going to pray together. And they said, okay, we'll, we'll show you how we do it. And uh, they started, we're all praying at the same time, me with my timid little voice, and them just shouting as loud as they can. And it went on for a long time because these people are so passionate about God. And it happened to be exactly when the youth were coming. And uh, so the youth are coming into the church right there at the, in the boardroom. And so they asked Terry, like, what's Russ doing in there? What's going on in there? And I, I think Terry's, I don't know, but I think they're maybe praying in tongues or something. Uh, it, was, it was English, I think. But uh, the passion that these people have for prayer and, and uh, how, uh, how timid by comparison I am, uh, it really struck me. And, uh, and these, these people see uh, miraculous things happen at, on, a, on a regular basis. Now, have I told you that the principal of my school when I was in grade 7, uh, I'm, I'm Mr. Newfelt, have I told you that he was like Santa Claus? What would you think that might mean? Big guy, kind of wore red, oh, see me, give me presents all the time? Uh, if that's what you thought, you'd be wrong. What I mean is, somehow magically he knew if I had been naughty or nice. Well, not always, because he only gave me the strap once. And uh, now that I kind of think about it, he, he looked like a younger version of Jake. So I don't know, maybe that's your, your brother. <laughs> now, this, this, uh, uh, it's important for us to understand what we mean when we say things. Now, uh, some people, the, the passage that Chris, some people say that's the most important paragraph in the whole Bible. It talks about our salvation. It describes what Christ has done for us. And unless we understand this passage, we don't understand what our salvation is about. Romans 3 verse 25 says, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement, faith in his blood. What this is talking about is the, the heart of the gospel, why Jesus came and died on the cross. And so this morning we're going to... Uh, we're understanding this. We're going to look at a bunch of different verses. We'll come back to Romans chapter 3 at the end. Uh, the Bible gives us five main reasons why Jesus had to die. 
And throughout church history, some people have focused on a one or two of these, and it leads us, uh, if we only focus on a few of them, it leads to the wrong paths. We need to understand all reasons. And so we want to spend a little bit of time uh, doing that this morning. Before we get into that, let me give you uh, two false explanations as to why Jesus died. The first one is some people believe that Jesus died by accident. That he was kind of leading a cause and it got out of control and this wasn't planned. And before they've killed him. Now nothing could be farther from the truth. Jesus continually said, that he was going to die. He predicted his own death. Many times he was saying, I have to go to Jerusalem. And he was quoting Old Testament scriptures about his death. Uh, this is what uh, uh, he said in John chapter 10. Take my life from me. Sacrifice it voluntarily. For I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. It wasn't an accident. Nobody took his life he voluntarily gave it up. The second reason, is, or a false explanation, is very similar, but is that Jesus died as a martyr. That he was a good man, that's all he was, was a good man, and he died for his cause. Kind of like Martin Luther King, you know, where, where you stand up for your principles, other things that, and eventually they get rid of you. But the facts are clear in Scripture that Jesus is God. His death was for a divine purpose. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, says this in his sermon. This is Acts chapter 2. But God knew what would happen. And he pre his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to the cross and killed him. Now, Jesus' death wasn't a surprise to Jesus or to God. In fact, it was part of the plan. Jesus said to his disciples over and over again, I have to go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man must die. He must be lifted. And so death wasn't an accident. He didn't die as a martyr. Rather, it was part of God's plan right from the very beginning. And so the Bible gives us five main reasons as to why Jesus died. And as I already said in church history, Various groups have emphasized uh, one or two of these and only emphasize one or two off base. We need to understand all five. And so the first reason is the ransom explanation. The key words here are ransom or payment. The main idea is that Jesus Christ died to pay a ransom to set us free. Now, I don't know about relations, but in, in TV shows, a kidnapper has taken somebody and they hold them for hostage and the way the hostages are set free is somebody pays a ransom. That's the kind of idea that the Bible is talking about here. The, the idea is summarized this way. Satan is at war with God. He has taken all of humanity as captive. We are his prisoners. We're prisoners to sin. Uh, Jesus came to exchange for us as a hostage, to pay the ransom with his own life. Jesus said, Mark chapter 10, even though the Son of Man came, or the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I've come to give my life pay so that you can be set from death, from slavery, from, from the law, from, from the devil. We are set free. Ephesians 1 God is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Jesus redeemed us. He paid a ransom. Now with each one of these, and the caution on this one is we might ask, well, if Jesus paid a ransom, who did he pay it to? And kind of the automatic response to that, well, then he must have paid a ransom to Satan. But that's not good theology. That's not a good way to understand it. There's a different way to understand it. And as Seth's talking about uh, a new, new mother, new baby, talking labor pains and saying she paid a great price in, in giving birth to this baby, you wouldn't ask, well, who did she pay that price to? It's just a word picture. It's a, a picture that, uh, that says that your salvation 
that Jesus paid a ransom, your salvation cost a lot. Jesus paid price. So the second, that's the, the ransom explanation. The second ac- explanation is moral influence. The key words here are love an example. The main idea is that Jesus died to demonstrate God's love to us. Uh, Jesus Christ has died to show us how much he loved us. He's an example of uh, God's graciousness to us. Jesus died to show us that God loves people and that he really cares. Jesus died on the cross in order to soften people's hearts so that when they look at him, they're moved by compassion and they say, God, forgive me. Forgive me for who I, for who I am. Now, one example would be uh, at the crucifixion it, itself where uh, there's two thieves who are crucified at the same time as Jesus. One of them mocks Jesus. The other one, though, says, this is Luke 23. Then one of the thieves said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus, I assure you, today you paradise. Now, Jesus never taught this man as a class or preached a sermon to him. He just saw what Jesus went through on the cross. And he recognized uh, the suffering of the Son of God. And he was moved to ask for forgiveness. God sent Jesus to die on the cross. It motivates us and causes us to change. First uh, Peter 2 is an example, for God called you to do good even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is example, and you must follow in his steps. He never sinned nor uh, ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge. He left his case in the God who always judge, judges fairly. Jesus didn't defend himself. Peter says, he is your example. Uh, Paul picks up the same idea in, in Ephesians chapter 5. Imitate God, therefore, in everything you do because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. Now, Jesus died as an example of God's love. But there's a real weakness if we emphasize this as the only reason why Jesus died. The caution here is that uh, Jesus' death is evil. Some, well, well, Jesus was a great e- example of sacrificial li- uh, love, and that's it. But that explanation doesn't take sin seriously enough. This can come across as uh, uh, in this way. All we need is an example. And if we look at Jesus and see how much he has done for us, it's going to... But the truth is, is I need more than an example to do better. I know what I ought to do. What's lacking isn't my knowing what to do. What's lacking is power to do it. I don't find my problem as understanding what God wants from me. My problem is having the power to act to do some people think, talk about Jesus dying on the cross, it will naturally make people want to follow him and live moral, good moral lives. But there's a lot of people who know about what Jesus has done, and it hasn't affected their lives at all. And so the, the second example is the, is the moral uh, explanation. That. Third explanation, that is the victory explanation. The key words are power triumph, and victory. The main idea is that Jesus died to destroy the works of Satan and to defeat him as free. The victory explanation of why Jesus had to die is this. History is a battleground. It's a battle between the forces of good and evil. When he died on the cross, guaranteed of Satan. Jesus destroyed the, uh, the, uh, the devil's power in our lives. Now, some verses of where this comes from, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. Not only for only could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who has the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves 
to the fear of dying. What this is talking about is the battle between Jesus and Satan. Jesus came to the power of the devil. and he, he didn't just pay a ransom. He came to devastate Satan. The devil knows that he's living on borrowed time. He already knows his time is over. He's read the book of Revelation. You see, when we start to get all up, up tight, we can read the book of Revelation. And you know, well, what is that about? Like, I can't understand that book. What, well, the, the, through the whole is we win. In the end, we win because of the victory of Jesus over the evil one. That's why it's such a comfort when it was written, when John wrote it to people who were suffering persecution under Nero, and they thought Nero was uh, the devil come in the flesh. John wrote it to hope to recognize that in the end, Christ has already won. And as a church, we win. Now, Colossians 1, uh, 13 and 14, For God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Just our freedom. And in these verses, we see the battle between two kingdoms. And we are transferred. We started off in the kingdom of darkness and we are transferred because of Christ's victory over Satan. We're transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Colossians 2, verses 14 and 15. 14 says, canceled the of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. All The list of all the bad things you have done. He take that list, he nailed it to the cross. Then it says, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. This is his cohorts. And Jesus made a public spectacle of them. This is all summarized very well in 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. It just says it simply. The Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. So that's the victory explanation, that Jesus came to destroy Satan. The fourth reason is the relationship explanation. The key word are peace and reconciliation. The main idea is that Jesus died so that you can be reconciled to God that peace and harmony can be brought into the relationship of people and God and people and people. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 5 it means that anyone in Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. He gave us this of reconciliation. So we are Christ ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak from Christ or for Christ when we plead, come back to God. What these verses are talking about is once we understand what Jesus has done for us, we need to tell everyone else, God loves you. God wants a relationship. He doesn't want to condemn you. Jesus took condemnation on himself. He wants to be in harmony with you. He reconciles us and he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That means not only sharing the message, but helping people get along with one another. That we were separated from God, but Jesus brought us together. Colossians 1 says, God was in Christ reconciling us to himself. The Bible also teaches that people are reconciled one to another, that Jews and Gentiles are reconciled together in Christ. The main idea to bring us together. What's the caution here? It's true that Jesus did bring us uh, die to, uh, uh, to reconcile us. But like all the others, this explanation by itself is incomplete. It doesn't explain, none of the ones that we've covered so far explain how God can simply and still be holy. That's why we come to the last of the five major reasons. 
This is the explanation that is taught most often in Scripture. It's the, the one with the most verses, the number one and primary explanation of why Jesus died, and that is the substitution explanation. The key words here are sacrifice and atonement. The main idea, Jesus died as a, a sacrifice for our sins. Romans 3, where we started. God presented him, presented Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. The words used here are legal terms. So the setting is like a courtroom. God is the judge. We end. The wages of sin is death. Our punishment, we deserve death. We've broken the law. But Jesus comes before the judge as our advocate, as our lawyer, and says, they're guilty, they deserve to be punished, but I will take their punishment for them. I will be their substitute. I will take their place. I will serve their sentence. The Bible says that's what Jesus, Hebrews chapter 9. So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come in not to deal with our sins, but to bring salvation to all who are eagerly waiting for him. He came the first time to die for our sins. He will do for everyone else. Jesus was nailed to the cross so you can stop nailing yourself to the cross. Jesus was condemned so you can stop condemning yourself. He was your substitute. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For God made Christ who never sinned to be an offering for your sin so that you could write with God through Christ. The one who deserved to die is set free and the one who never did anything wrong is the one who dies. He takes our place. Uh, there's many verses. Many, uh, I'll give you one more. First Peter chapter 3. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned. But he died for sinners to bring you home to God. Now, what's the caution on this one? The caution is that this theology can be presented in such a way that God appears to be angry and Jesus intervenes as the hero to protect us. Sometimes this, this part is taught in such a way that it makes us want to love Jesus but hate God. I once heard somebody teaching this. That they used an illustration. They had a hammer. It was an object lesson. A hammer, which represented God. A glass bowl that represents us. And a great big pot that rec uh, represents Jesus. The guy is going to take this hammer and smash. So God's going to smash the glass bowl. At the last second, somebody thought over top of the bowl and the hammer keeps hitting the pot but we're safe underneath. This concept, the concept of substitution is there, all right. But if we take that illustration to its logical conclusion, it's like one little boy says, I love Jesus, but I don't like God. Look, it's full and wrathful, but Christ trying to, and Christ trying to convince uh, God to not hurt us. It draws to mind a, a picture of of my childhood with my dad wanting to give me a good old whipping and my mom uh, trying to hold the door shut and, and keep him up. Angry, dad, merciful mom. Uh, you know, you end up loving your mom and not so much your dad, right? Now, we need to be careful how we, we look at this, at these verses. You need to remember that God is God and Jesus is God. It isn't a matter of God saying, I'm going to beat up these sinners and then someone else jumping in as the hero from the outside, a third party, and saying, I'm going to protect these people. More what it's like is God saying, somebody has to pay for this sin and instantly God saying, I'm going to do it. No third party involved. When punishment came, God said, I'll be their substitute. So those are the five main reasons, the five reasons the Bible gives as to why Jesus died. Now what should be our response to all of this? Once we understand why Jesus died, 
We, there's three things we should do in response. Is we ought to hate sin. First Peter 1 verse 15 says, But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. God wants us to live pure lives. Holy lives. Lives that are righteous. Living as best as we can in the power of the Holy Spirit sinning. Why should we hate sin? Because we see what sin did to Jesus and what it does to other people's lives, how it destroys people. So, first of all, we ought to hate sin. Secondly, we ought to love Christ. When we look at Jesus, what He's done for us, came down from heaven, how He, how he suffered in our place, we ought to say, I want to give myself completely to Him. I should say, by the way, these these people from the Congo that were praying with me, you could just feel it in their lives. They'd been through uh, war and struggle. And just, like, it was very humbling just to watch that and see uh, their commitment, their their passion, their enthusiasm, their, their willingness to sacrifice anything and everything for Him. 1 John 4 talks about the fact that He gave Himself for us. And because He loves us, we ought to love Him in return. If He loved us enough to leave heaven to go to the cross, surely we should respond with devotion to Him. The third uh, response is we ought to make the message known. First Corinthians, or second five, Paul says the love of God and the love of Christ compels us. Compels us to share the good news. Can you imagine uh, the event as important as, as the cross and yet we keep it a secret? If someone died for you, wouldn't you want to know about it? If I had the cure for cancer... It'd be criminal to, to not, uh, not tell you about it. Uh, there, uh, some years ago, there was a, uh, a video uh, on, on YouTube. Uh, a guy named, uh, you, you know, the, the Penn and Teller? You know that comedy? Uh, where the, Penn is the great big guy. Is that right? Or is that, that's Penn, right? Anyhow, he's, t- he's talking about these dumb Christians who believe the gospel and believe about Jesus. But then he says, and he's talking about a Gideon who gave him a Bible. And he's saying, you know, the guy's a really good man. And he really believes this stuff. And then he stops and he says, what I don't get is, they really believe this. Why don't they tell me about it? He said, if I saw a bus coming and it's going to crunch all these kids, I would yell, I'd jump, and I'd push them out of the way. Now, I, I don't want to guilt on you. When it comes to we always feel guilty about that stuff anyhow, right? But, but Penn is saying, if these people really believe this, why don't they tell me? And this guy gave me a gill, and he, even though he's crazy because he believes this stuff because there is no God is, is what, what Penn, where Penn is coming from but at least he told and so our response to the fact that Jesus died on the cross first of all we hate sin because we see what it did to Jesus and what it, we see what it does to us we see what it does to other people Secondly, we love Christ because we see what He's done, the price He paid. Thirdly, we tell the message to others. Let's pray. Father, we thank You that You sent Christ to be our example, to pay the ransom, to uh, uh, destroy the works of the evil one, to be our subject, to demonstrate your love for us. We marvel at your love. I pray that you would 
awaken in our hearts a new level of understanding of what you have done for us so that we in new ways hate sin love you and tell others about it in the name of christ amen